today we are computing some limits. Um, sort of talk to you about what limits are. And we've sort of done some limits, but it was already just kind of kind of guessing all of it. So let's actually learn how to do this. <clears throat> how do we do this? I'm not muted in my phone. Okay. So um, in the book, this is section 2.3. And we're going to start with these things that are, well, these, these rules that are super relatable. Um, so I don't think you're going to have any issues with them. So, um, Say we have two functions. Mm -hmm. Say we have two functions and we know the limits. What happens when we add them? What happens when we subtract them? What happens when, you, when we multiply them? Two functions, f and g, and, and the, the limits of f and the limits of g exist. Um, and say c is a number. So what happens, um, what happens when I add them? If f is approaching 2 and g is approaching 3, what do you think is going to happen when I take the limit of the sum? Well, it's indeed approaching 5, like you would think. Um, what happens when you subtract them? Um, probably not a surprise that you get the difference of the limits. It's just basically everything you could think of works as expected. If f is approaching three and then I multiply f by two and try to take the limit, um, it better approach six. <clears throat> and indeed it does. Of course, it is all provided that, like I said above, the limits of f and g exist because if they don't, uh, what am I even doing? <clears throat> like the, I have no idea what happens. Um, what happens when I multiply f and g? Well, I mean, this is even less exciting than the last Star Wars. And something a bit more exciting happens when you divide, because when you divide, uh, what 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 is exciting when you divide? When you divide, uh, you could always be divided by zero, and and that you know has a chance of destroying the universe, which is always exciting. So um, this is this only works as long as the limit of g is not zero. If you're dividing by something that approaches zero, you have no clue what happens. So, okay. So this is part of it. I'm not done, but 
it's very important that for these things to make sense, the limits have to exist. You can't, if the limit of f is 1 and the limit of g is does not exist, there's no way you're going to be able to add 1 to does not exist. <clears throat> um, and in the last one, it's very important that the limit of g is not 0, because, I mean, what are you even... What do you even mean by, I mean, you you can't divide by zero. That's just what life is. I mean, sometimes when there's a zero in the denominator, the limit is infinity, but sometimes it isn't. Sometimes the limit is zero. You just have to figure it out every time. Um, okay, so we have, oh. So these, I guess, have names which have never, I don't know, people, people don't use these by name, is the thing. But I guess while we're doing calculus, um, you can call this the sum law, the difference law. Uh, does this have a name? Some multiple law is what the book says. But I mean, a lot of things in this book, you know, have names that everyone uses, and this is not one of them. Nobody talks about the product law of limits. You would just say the limit of the the products is the product of the limits. Okay, so I mean, there's more things we can do. You can. You can take roots, you can take powers, and I'm just gonna <clears throat> write them all down to be done with it. So, presentations of the, the page, the last page. What happens if you take the power of F and you try to do the limit, well, you get um, you get the same as if you did the limit and then uh, to the power. What was the last law called? Quotient. But I mean. You're free to call it division law. Doesn't matter. Uh, so, oh, this one is called power law, I guess, because we take a power. Um, And this, when does this work? Um, it works if, um, if I, if this makes sense, um, and not at all powers make sense. Um, so let's say this works if, if, if n is a positive integer, because you can always take a power of a positive, positive. An integer. It's a whole number. You can always take whole number powers. The problem is when you take half powers, um, and then you can only take. Um, uh, you can't take that. Then you're taking square roots, and you can't take those of negative numbers. Um, or. If the limit is positive, <clears throat> because otherwise this expression doesn't make sense. Um, okay, if I take the function that always, if I take the function uh, that always gives me a number seven, you tell me a number and I tell you seven. What happens as the number that you tell me approaches um, zero? Well, what happens is I'm always going to tell you seven 
So the answer is going to approach seven. If I if uh, the result of the function is always c, the same number, the limit anywhere is going to be c. This also doesn't have a name. Um, this is another very silly law. If you take uh, the function that always returns the number you put in, you put in. So you give me the number three, I tell you three. Give me negative one, I tell you negative one. So what's going to happen if you give me numbers approaching four? Well, you tell me 3.9, I tell you 3.9, tell me 3.99, I'll tell you 3.99. And as your numbers approach four, my numbers are going to approach four because they're the same numbers. So, um, what did I, how did I put, who did I put what I just said into a formula? Um, um, it's a great question. <clears throat> so I said the limit, so what is, I said if, if, the, if I approach four, the answer is gonna be just four. And where is the number that I'm approaching here? The number that I'm, I'm approaching is A. So um, this not, this answer is just a. Um, it's the same as if I plugged into the function x equals a. That's the case for a lot of limits. I'm going to write this just in case <clears throat> and it's included in what I said but before but you can also take your roots so if you have if you take your root and then a limit it's the same as taking a limit and then a root Oof, I can't talk <clears throat> I'm gonna get water. Give me a second. Something exciting to put into my symptom checker. Okay, so um, so that's all there is. Now the whole point is how to use this. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Okay, so I'm going to do an example. It's going to be very silly. Okay, but before I do that, so these are these are all things that you can prove. You take f, you take a, a function f, so you're pretending that it's any function in the world, so you can just call it f, and you say, imagine that it approaches a number L1, which means that f gets as close to L1 as I want uh, when x is close to a, and you say the same for g, and then you prove that the, that F, uh, f of x plus g of x approaches um, whatever sum of the limits that I want. And, well, I think the book does, does this in the appendix, but I'm just going to skip it. Because also, I'm going to skip 2.4, which is the precise definition of a limit. Um, so, I'm not going to prove this, but I think, I think you're not, you're not going to have any trouble believing them. But it's good to know that we can prove things honestly, because otherwise we just believe things because they're in a book, and that's probably a bad idea. So we can use these um, in a. So let me give you an example that um, might seem very silly. Let's say take the limit as x goes to. Two of x 
x squared minus 3x plus 4. <clears throat> so what's this limit? I'm in here by myself. to sleep. Is it two? <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. It is two. It's, oh, no, this. Okay, it's two. Maybe you were suspicious. It wasn't a trick question. The limit is two. <clears throat> um, but how do we know this how I mean it's just I mean it's a great guess um, saying that it's two because I mean it is true but a wait you know if we believe if we have proofs of limit loss which is maybe it's a bit sad that we didn't but you might want to kill me if I did um, we would know for sure that the limit loss are true. So I'm going to use the limit loss um, to show that this is true. I'm going to be super careful, and then I'm never going to be as careful in my life, because you're going to know why things work. Uh, I, I did give you a homework problem for two weeks from now, where you have to be super careful. Uh, but I'm only going to ask you to do it once. So, okay, so what is this function? It's a sum of three things. It's a sum of x squared, it's a sum of uh, and then negative three to the x, and then four. So I need to find probably those three limits and then use the, the sum law. So, <clears throat> so what's that? So first of all, the limit of uh, the limit of x is 2. I didn't give this law a name, but this was the law that said that the limit of x is whatever. I can find the limit of x by, uh, by plugging in. So what is the limit of x squared? The limit of x squared, uh, well, I know what the limit of x is, and I wonder what's the square of this. Uh, I wonder if, if this is the square, and it is, and why was I able to do this? I was able to do this because of the, the power law. The power law is in the previous page that says that if I take the limit of um, of the nth power of a function, I can I can take first the limit and then the nth power. And this is good for me because I know what the limit is. It's uh, 2. So the limit of x squared is 4. I know, I mean, I know I'm not surprising you, except for why am I, maybe why, why do this? Um, OK. So that's the limit of x squared. What about the limit of negative 3x? Um, the limit of 3x, well, again, I know the limit of x. So this better be negative 3 times, the, times 2. Uh, and why is this? This is because, um, well, 
I call this, the book called this, the constant multiple rule. Uh, rule, law, I don't even remember. The one that said that you take a function, you multiply it by its C, and then you can pull the, the C out. And this is negative three, well, I, this limit I computed above, it's two, so this is negative six. And finally, the limit of, of four. Well, if whatever you ask me, I tell you four, wherever you approach, you're gonna get four. And this was also a law. Let's see, the law that when you approach A with a constant, you get the same constant. So now I have the three limits and I add them together by Um, by, uh, I add them together by using the the sum law x squared minus 3x plus 4 well, 1, 2 no. what I mean what I, uh, so now I have the limit of a sum of things I know the limit of each of the things in the sum I wonder if I could split this um and I can because um, of the sum law. X approaches two, negative three X. Probably put brackets if I see a minus sign, that's always a good idea. Either put brackets always everywhere or Put brackets at least in in your whenever you see a minus sign. So I use the sum law here. The sum law has only two things, but if I do it twice, I can add three things together. And these are three limits that I've already computed: four, negative six, four, and the limit is eight. And why did I do this? If I could have just said Aaron Booker Serene. Uh, so here's the four, here's the six, and here's the other four. Um, well, now I know for sure that the limit of this function um, is, eight, I said eight, eight minus six, which is two, is two. But the thing is, so, my real point is uh, that, was there anything special about this function? No. If you take any polynomial, um, yes. so I use letters here, you're gonna discard. <clears throat> If you take any polynomial, the limit as, as, as x goes to a is found by logging in. Um, x equals to a. So the thing is, what am I saying? So, okay, first of all, this is called the direct substitution rule in the book. Again, this is not a term that I've heard uh, anywhere outside of Stuart's calculus, but um, so what am I saying? I'm saying if I ask you to compute the limit as x approaches one of x to the fifth minus three x to the fourth, plus x to the 18 minus one plus x squared. Um, I mean, you know how to do this. You know what the limit laws, uh, the limit laws tell you to do. The thing is, this is made of uh, a polynomial. It's anything that's made, it's anything that looks like that. It's anything made of some subtractions and multiplications. Um, and I know for each of those, and, and 
the function x. I know for each of those, I can find the limit by just repeating what I just did. So I know at the very end, uh, what I'm going to get is just the direct substitution law tells me I can plug in one. So this limit is one to the fifth minus three times one to the fourth plus one to the 18 minus one plus one squared one minus two uh, negative one. And, and that took 30 seconds. So, so now we know how to compute, compute a bunch of limits. We know how to compute the limit of any polynomial and you do it by um, just plugging in, which begs the question, why even think about limits? Um, but there's the answer is that this doesn't work for every limit. Okay, are there any questions? long week for you too, huh? Yeah, Dustin. So, okay, so whenever we deal with limits and stuff, and we, is this, are these laws like for any situation where we're dealing with um, like the function being, like, it doesn't necessarily just have to be a polynomial, it can be. Um, no, it doesn't have to be. If you know, you know, you have a very complicated function, but you know it's limit, and you have another one, and you know it's limit, you know that some, you know, the only, the only requirement is that the limits exist, which kind of makes sense. You can't add, add a number to something that doesn't exist. That's, but other than that, anything, there's even some problems, I'm pretty sure in your online homework that go, I'm not gonna tell you the function, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna tell you the limit of f is two and the limit of g is four. What's the limit of f plus g? Well, you don't know uh, you don't know what the function is, but you know the limit of f plus g is going to be 6, whatever f and g are, you know? So, no requirements. The, the polynomial thing was just the easiest example of where to use this, but you can use this anywhere. Okay. Uh, so, the next example, uh, which is similar, but a bit more interesting, is... Um, that you can do this for a rational function. So, if you have a rational function, so what's a rational function? Um, the rational function, remember, is the quotient of two polynomials or something in general, something you get from adding, subtraction, multiplying, and dividing. So, so P and Q are polynomials. Um, you can compute the limit. So basically using all the limit laws, Again, now you would use the one for the sum, the power, the product, and also the one for division. Uh, this is going to work. You can just plug in as long as you can plug in and it makes sense. Um, only one condition. The one condition is that the denominator is not zero. is a super important. If the denominator is zero, basically you don't know what happens. That's where things get interesting. Uh, but here's an example where you can do this. Say the limit as x approaches zero of x squared plus three divided by x minus one. Well, this is just zero squared plus three divided by zero minus one. Um, Notice that the denominator is not zero. So this works. Um, uh, I, I have a question. Yeah. What do we do if the denominator is zero? Oh, that's, um, I mean, that's the, uh, yeah, that's a real hard question. 
I don't have I don't have an answer. My plan is to do a lot of examples. And you know, depending on what the function looks like, you can do different things. But basically, uh, that's hard. I'm starting with the easiest thing I can think of, and then I'm moving on to harder things. Uh, if the denominator is not zero, the thing is, it's entirely possible that like there's nothing you can do. I don't know if I can. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't say for sure I can solve every limit problem where the denominator is zero. So I definitely don't have a recipe. This is what math is. Um, if, if there was a recipe for everything, we would just tell a computer to do it and not teach anyone. That's also, you know, why you will have a salary in the future because these things are hard. So let's not complain that things are hard. Um, so, okay, so here's an example where the denominator is zero. Um, and I think, I mean, I think a bunch of you remember what you're supposed to do. What example did I want to do? Um, So this limit of it's a rational function because the, it's a quotient of polynomials. Um, if I try plugging in, which should be, ugh, should be the first thing that you try always because you should start doing the easiest thing because if the easiest thing works, uh, then you don't have to do anything else. That's just smart. So I'm going to start by plugging in, which I can do. I can do it in my head in five seconds, and I can do it in writing in ten. Two squared minus six plus two. If I was even smarter, I would start by the denominator, which is the important thing. So this is going to be. Well, the denominator is zero, so I have no idea what to do. If the numerator was a number, um, I, I would know that the limit does not exist. Uh, which would be great, but the numerator is also zero. And you've been told, I think, some of you, that this is an indeterminacy, that this is undefined. I mean, I don't know. It's Yeah, I guess it's undefined. It's just whatever you call it, it's, it's nothing I can work with. Um, Definitely, you cannot divide zero by zero. Um, undefined. Whatever it means, it means I have to work more. Um, so, I generally the answer is. Let me write that down. The answer to these kind of problems is. Try to use algebra to re to rewrite into something you can compute. But try to use algebra could mean a lot of different things depending on what your function is. To make the limit doable. So, what kind of algebra can I do to this? Um, one, two, three, three, six, three, four. Um, is it one? I don't know if it's one. If you mean zero divided by zero, something, a limit where the numerator and the denominator goes to zero could literally be anything. It could be a limit that does not exist. It could be infinity. It could be negative infinity. It could be any number in between. I can, t I can show you a limit that, that is zero divided by zero that gives you any number you ask me to. So basically, we know nothing. Um, if you're saying that this limit, that the final answer is one, I don't know. 
Um, don't remember what the answer was. But what algebra can I use here with this uh, function? I know you know because it's your favorite piece of algebra. So I'm just gonna patiently wait for you to um, to tell me what I can do. Factory, exactly. Um, so, well, I remember vaguely that the denominator has to be one and there's no way I'm gonna be able to factor that. So probably you mean the numerator. Um, so I know you know the answer. Wait, so would we do this every time we encounter a problem, like a, a limit problem uh, when it's like indeterminate? We would try to make it doable by like prob uh, possibly factoring it or something. Well, yeah, or I mean, just like I can't. It's not a, factoring is not always going to work. Um, but it's a good idea to try, you know. So sometimes we can turn like undefined limits into a, like a, a limit that's defined, but and then sometimes we can't. Uh, yeah, I mean. You can, the thing is, there's different things you can try. Some of them sometimes work, some of them don't. Factoring works some of the time. I mean, if it's a rational function, factoring is always going to work. Uh, but um, not all functions are rational functions. Yeah. But I mean, how it works is you try things until something sticks. I know you're not used to this kind of working. I know you, most of the maths or all of the math in high school, you you have a problem and they tell you for these type of problems, you do this thing. And for these type of problems, you do this thing. But the thing is, that's not how life is. That's not how math is. That's not how, that's not how anything is. If it was like that, uh, well, then you wouldn't need a college degree to do anything because you can teach a computer to do a thing. You can teach a you teach a monkey to follow these instructions. Maybe it would be interesting to try. Um, but the thing is, the problems. I mean, this is not a real life problem. This is a silly calculus problem. But problems in real life, they don't come with a set of instructions. You know, uh, they're they're interesting because a priori we don't know what to do with them, and then we find out. Uh, and much more valuable than knowing what a limit is, is having, knowing how to approach a problem, knowing how to just throw things at a problem and not get discouraged. And that, that's a much more applicable skill than finding the limit of the rational function. So uh, this polynomial factors Sx minus two times x minus one. I do this using the formula uh, which is minus b plus minus root of 9 minus a divided by 2. <laughs> but in American high schools, there's some magical trick that people do in their minds. Okay, so now we see, and this gives me 2 or 1. So now we see that this function, um, it, looks, um, it looks interesting. Um, it looks like there, well, there's an x minus two in the numerator and an x minus two in the denominator. So um, I can just cancel those. So as long as x, my, x is not two, I mean, if x equals two, then this is not defined. But if x is not two, then um, those just um, cancel. And the thing is, I don't care what happens as x equals 2, because if I compute the limit as, at x equals 2, uh, the only thing I don't care about is what happens exactly at 2. Anything could happen, and I wouldn't care. So in this case, um, there's no function at 2, but I don't care. So now this is the limit at, um, of x minus 1, and this is a limit I know how to do. I know I can plug it in, it's a polynomial. So I'm done. So the limit is 1. So 
So it's a reading cloud. Well done. Okay, so um, if you see a, if you see a rational function and it looks like zero divided by zero, factoring is a good idea. Um, this um, pretty much always works for rational functions. Um, If, if, I mean, for this kind of limit, but there's also limits at infinity that we haven't seen yet, but the thing is, when you see them, you try to factor them, and that's pretty useless for those. Um, let me tell you, let me do, um, Another example. <clears throat> the limit uh, sex approaches to uh, x squared minus 3x plus 1 divided by x minus 2. So almost the same limit. Um, if I if I try plugging in I get four minus six plus one divided by zero. This is uh, negative one divided by zero. So, just for, so something that goes to a number divided by something that goes to zero, that's going to go to a plus minus infinity. Uh, so this limit does not exist. And that's it, I'm done. So I guess you only really have a problem if the if the limit so um, if the limit is zero divided by zero or does not exist something that doesn't exist divided by zero if you have zero divided by zero or limit that does not exist divided by zero. These you you really can't say anything about. Um, but I guess a limit I mean this could be no uh, this could be anything. This could be um, I don't think this could be anything. But if it's, um, if you have a number, if you have a number divided by zero, and the number is not zero, then the limit, um, the limit is plus minus infinity. <clears throat> because you have, if you have something like something like this example, something approaching negative one divided by a very small number, that's just always going to be very big, maybe positive or negative. Um, but it's going to, um, it's going to go to plus minus infinity. Maybe, maybe you need to figure out the sign if I ask you, is it positive or negative infinity? So Matthew asks, so only use zero substitution for any polynomial rational function only with non-zero denominators. Yes, I mean, if you have a rational function with zero denominators, it's just not gonna work. Um, I mean, this kind of almost works. Um, so this limit is plus minus infinity. It's either one or the other, I don't know. Maybe also it could be one on one side and the other on, on the other side. Definitely gonna be that. Uh, there's other functions you can use the direct substitution method. Uh, I haven't gotten there yet, but we'll see that there's basically the answer is continuous functions. And the I think 2.5 is talking about what a continuous function is. Like the exponential function, sine, cosine, basically 
almost every function you can think of, almost always it works, the direct substitution method. The thing is, seeing when it doesn't work tends to be a lot more interesting. Okay, so here's another example, which is not a, not a rational function. Wait, so the other one was the answer that it doesn't exist or was it plus infinity? Well, I mean, so it depends. The definitely does not exist is an answer, if, depending on what the question is. If the question is, find this limit or tell me if it doesn't exist, then the answer is it doesn't exist. If the, if the question was, find this limit and tell me if, it's, if it doesn't exist, tell me if it's infinite or not, then the answer, you would have to specify what happens. Uh, you know that it doesn't exist, but you have to be more detailed. Okay. You're talking about social networks I've never heard of. Okay. Um, so this is, um, this is an example. From the from the book that I like, um, the limit. So this is a limit that I a couple of days ago we drew, and it was the one. It was the one where the computer got really confused. Sorry, like when you zoom in a lot, it started looking really wavy, and it didn't look like there was a limit, but there is. <clears throat> so. Um, let's see that this limit is actually whatever we thought it was going to be, which I forgot what it was. So the thing is, um, the limit of the numerator is zero. Um, because I can use the limit law, I can use um, the one for the square, then the one for adding nine, then the one for the roots, then the one for subtracting. Basically, I can substitute for this function. Zero squared plus nine minus three. Why are you not writing? So this limit is, is zero. Uh, the limit of the denominator is also zero. And that's a problem because I'm not going to be able to use the quotient law. Okay, so um, um, we have so we have zero divided by zero, which is not really. I mean, this is something we we say, but it's not really a thing. It's not a number. It's just what we, is the reason why we can't use the, the limit law. So we have to do something. So like before the answer is gonna be, try to use some algebra to, to make the problem uh, treatable. So, Okay. Um, what's the, um, so what algebra can we use? So now we can factor. I mean, I can factor the denominator, it's t times t, but I'm not going to be able to factor in a way where there's the same factor, um, the numerator and the denominator. You use the opposite of the numerator. Yeah, that's the thing that works. So one thing, uh, one thing you've learned in algebra that works, it's what the book wants you to do. And here, um, it's not my favorite thing to do, but I guess it works. Um, so if you see a square root uh, added with something like another square root, I know this gets simpler when I, when I use the, the rule that says that a plus b times a minus b is the difference of squares because I would like to take the square of a square root. So of course, I can't do this unless I divide by the same thing. <clears throat> if, I, if I do this, if I multiply by this 
whole thing here, then I'm multiplying by one, and I'm allowed to multiply that one. That's not doing anything. Um, so this is gonna work. This is gonna make it simple enough. I'll do it tomorrow because today I'm out of time. All right. So my office hours are uh, today uh, ten. Merge three to root nine and add it to the root. Cool. Right. Well, okay. I'm gonna stop the class there, but I'm gonna answer to Serene.